What would you like to see change in your life? And what is the biggest obstacle that you're facing now? I run two programs called Inner Knowing and Good Life Designed for serious individuals who are ready to take the next step in their personal and professional lives. I will personally be coaching a small group of individuals on tools and frameworks for creating an intuitive practice and for creating self-mastery in their life. As someone who's helped countless entrepreneurs open doors of possibility that they never thought existed, I've seen these strategies transform people's lives. The best part is that you'll 10x your output, unlock your creative genius. I'll work with you weekly to overcome your limiting beliefs. I'll teach you how to create clarity, processes, develop your intuition, and set a new framework on how to live your best life. And you'll get access to guided meditations that I have personally created that are not available anywhere else. We'll create a new self-concept that you can practice moving forward. This method is so effective that even if you don't have a lot of time or if you think you're not ready for a change, these frameworks and methodologies will still work for you. You can check out the link in the show notes to join the waiting list and You can also check out what some of the previous clients had to say about our time together. It's first come, first serve, and I hope to see you there. Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. In today's episode, I'll be speaking with Lauren Francis, an internationally acclaimed love and relationships expert, best-selling author, and media personality, and one of the world's premier experts in the field of digital romance and online dating. She's been called the doctor of love by Extra, the flirt fairy by Victoria's Secret, and the man whisperer on Bravo. But Lauren's favorite nickname is being the real-life fairy godmother to her graduates and fans, and her practice has spanned the globe. Her uniquely effective advice about modern romance has been featured on Bravo, Extra, VH1, Oxygen, NBC, KTLA, and Fox and the Doctors, The Real Housewives of OC, The Real, (laughs) we just keep on going. (laughs) Lauren authored the internationally acclaimed bestseller Dating, Mating, and Manhandling, The Ornithological Guide to Men, which has been translated into eight languages and has been called the definitive and delicious dating guide for women everywhere. She's also the founder of Love Script Beauty and the former strategic director of ChildUSA.org and think tank for children's civil liberties. And I had the pleasure of meeting Lauren um, about a month ago uh, through a mutual friend and just had an absolute joy in connecting with her. So welcome to the show, Lauren. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight. And if you haven't had the opportunity to meet Yasmin in person, it's a magical experience. (laughs) Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Thank- what were you going to say? <laughs> no, I'm curious. Just, <laughs> if it could be, if it could be bottled, it would be like I actually have a perfume called Love Script, and you're kind of like a walking bottle of Love Script. You know, as a human being, it's just amazing. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet, Lauren. I, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we spoke a little bit about uh, the, the topic of dating when we got together, and uh, I'd love to just kick it off. You know, why are so many people so frustrated and confused when it comes to online dating and just in general dating in particular? Oh my gosh, that is you just just we just dove right into the deep end. So <laughs> the reason why people are frustrated with, uh, well, with dating in general is because you know, it is to find somebody that you're truly compatible with and that you're really in alignment with in terms of your core values and that you're also magically attracted to, that you like the way that they smell, that they're geographically desirable. There are a lot of things that need to line up to make, you know, a thing go right. So I think that, um, you know, the very first thing that I always tell my clients uh, and anybody that's really interested in creating what I call legendary love, epic love, is that you know you need to be willing to be disappointed in order to find love. You have to be able to manage your relationship to being disappointed because most people are not going to be the right fit, right? right? So when people get disappointed, your relationship to disappointment, it's kind of like playing a sport. If you're bad at it right away, 
and you just throw down your racket, you're not going to ever get really good at it or really, you know, kind of find what you're <laughs> looking for. So that's the first thing is that, you know, people sometimes are very sensitive about being rejected or not, you know, having instant gratification. But the reason why so many people are frustrated with online dating is that it is like the wild west <laughs> and nobody was really born unless you are, uh, you know, a Gen Z, uh, Zier with the option of having online dating as a thing. So it's not quite a natural experience and there really are tools and ways to learn how to be an effective communicator and to really profile what you're looking for and to not kind of fall into what I call unfocused flirting. Um, and, and that's really why God made me. (laughs) <laughs> I help people not waste their time. Oh, okay. So I have so many questions coming from that. So first of all, um, what, do, what do you mean by unfocused flirting? And then actually I'll ask my second question after this. Oh, sure. Well, unfocused flirting, well, that can happen at any time, but in in the world of online dating, it's just like you're looking at, you know, do they look cute? Swipe right. Do they look hot? Swipe right. Do you like their car? Swipe right. They're not reading the profile. And and honestly, I just do think for the purposes of, you know, if you're on dating apps, you know, look at somebody and if you like their look, you can swipe right. But if they connect with you, read the profile before you text back and forth. Right. So, you know, and a lot of men just like, it's a numbers game. It's like swipe, swipe, swipe. So they're just waiting to see if anything responds back to them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man. So uh, <laughs> that's so funny. So what are some of the things that if you are like let's say, you know, single and looking and dating um online and also offline, like what are some of the things that you should be looking for as a woman? Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> um <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so the biggest thing that is always a shock to women is that you should put your, you should really clearly state what your relationship goals are. And everyone is really taught, oh my God, I'm so afraid, you know, I don't want to scare men off. But the truth is you do want to scare the wrong men off right away because you don't want to waste your time. So that would be like saying, oh, I want to apply for a job, but what kind of job, any kind of job, (laughs) you know? So you want to, if you're a CEO, you want to apply for jobs that really you know, have your benefits, your pay scale, your education level, you know, that are, that are actually appropriate fits. So in dating apps, it's always really important to say, you know, if you want to create a family, if you want to create marriage, it's really important to put it in there because men that are just looking for a casual thing will not bother wasting their time with you. Hmm. For the most part, they'll just move on to somebody who's actually looking for what you're looking for. And, you know, I always say that getting into a relationship is like getting into the cockpit of an airplane. You know, if you, if some, if your partner wants to go to Paris and you want to go to Brazil, somebody's getting hijacked or the plane is going to crash. (laughs) So you want to make sure that before you take off, you're both buckling up and you both want to go in the same direction. So that's really the very first thing. And that usually surprises a lot of my clients, you know, in America and in Europe. It's just, they're like completely shocked. It's not too forward to do. And interestingly, you know, in the Middle East, I I work with clients all over the world. Um, You know, I think that, uh, you know, um, in India, you know, in Muslim countries, I think that it's more common for people to really, you know, be looking for marriage. Right. So, but I think that it's really important no matter where you live to got, to really be clear in a very simple way about what it is that you're looking for. So that's, that's going to save you a lot of time. And the second thing is that you should never ever agree to meet anybody unless you get on the, a phone call with them first. Mm. Because the phone, you know, it's like a lot of people that are under 40 are just so used to texting, text, text, text. And there's something about hearing the timbre of somebody's voice is their conversational flow. You know, what people write in profiles 
and who they really are does not always line up. So it's really important to have a, a phone call first. I love that. I mean, so explicitly stating your relationship goal. I mean, it's interesting because I think the pushback, and you mentioned that, is that, you know, sometimes people don't want that like pressure or tension early on. They sort of want to feel a sense of liberty. Um, and, I, you know, there are stories like of people dating for forever and then they, you know, they get married and it's not, you know, and it's great. But I'm curious, you know, um, can you say a little bit more about that, like, that, that tension, like that, um, you know, like the idea that we have to explicitly state our goals or is it something we state on like the third date or is it, is it really on the first date? Well, I think it's on, so if you're meeting people from a dating app or dating profiles, right, you put it in the profile, you put it right there. And, you know, you can check now about what kind of relationship people are looking for, but then you want to write it in actual words so that you can say, I'm looking for a magnificent marriage or an epic romance, or I'm just up for fun. Whatever it is that you're looking for is something that you should write in your profile so that people can read it. Because again, you know, um, you know, for speaking to women, like men are swipe, swipe, swiping, you're cute. And they're not necessarily going to read the profile, right? So you want to, um, they're not going to remember what it was they swiped on. So you really want to clearly state anything that's really important to you. Um, you know, if you're a divorcee, if you're, you know, already a mother or whatever it is that you, um, feel is really important. You know, if you, um, uh, you know, live with a profound sense of kind of faith, or if you are taking care of aging parents or whatever it is that is going to impact somebody else's life, you know, your, your relationship goals are not going to be changed by somebody else. And that's really, I think that's the hardest thing for people to believe and understand Mm. is that, you know, men that say that they don't want children actually don't want children. (laughs) (laughs) Men that don't want to get married really don't. Now, could they change their mind? Yes. But why not find somebody who wants the things you want right out of the gate? Mm, You don't want to date forever. The ice caps are melting. So let's go find people that want what you want and enjoy them right now. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then, so you spoke about like having a phone call before connecting with the person, you know, in person. And what's the sort of uh, importance in that? Just, you, you know, you mentioned a little bit about hearing their voice and hearing the cadence of their voice, but you, I guess you could tell a lot right from, from the gate in the conversation. Yes. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to circle back to online dating and why people are frustrated. Can we just kind of take a step back for a second? Yeah, of course. The, the phone call is really critical, but the phone call is not going to be that meaningful if we don't get this part right. So in the profile, right, you really want to write what your relationship goals are. And then you want to write things that are kind of very personal to you. So there's sensorial things like sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. And so, you know, you'll find me, you know, eating a delicious peach by the Ganges River, right? Something visual, something beautiful that pe- that makes it personal to you. So writing something that you love to do, something that you love to eat, your favorite dessert, your favorite, um, you don't want to put a favorite place that you go that would be an obvious place, right? Like your favorite restaurant. You don't want to put that in there because you know, it's online dating and you don't want people knowing your location until, you know, and information about who you are and where you go and private information is not a you know, it's a privilege. It's not a right. So people have to earn in. And especially, you know, my, my work is really about teaching women how to be safe daters, how to safely date online. So it's important to not have any really specifically identifying information about who you are, where you live. If you've got a very unusual name, you know, create a nickname and then Mm -hmm. you can always change that later. And of course, photos, right? So photos, it's, you know, online dating is an ad campaign for love. (laughs) So you want to put your best foot forward 
and have the most alluring, attractive photos of you possible. And I do these amazing makeovers for women flying in from around the world. They're called the love magnet makeovers. Um, and, uh, you know, but really dressing for love and really being, um, really presenting yourself. This is an easy way to say it is that you want to be the woman that the man that you're dreaming of is dreaming of. Mm, I love that. And men need to be the men that women are dreaming of, are dreaming of. So when people are frustrated with online dating, a lot of it is that they're, they haven't kind of up leveled their own, their own game. They haven't up leveled themselves to the level of their own aspirations. Right. So you can want a lot, but you also need to rise to the occasion of what it is that you're wanting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like you have to become the person who is the match to the person that you want to be with. Exactly. And it's like a dream space. Like, so a lot of romance is about fantasy and wish fulfillment, but it would be like if you wanted to, um, you know, become best selling author, but you didn't want to bother writing a book proposal. You know what I mean? And so it's just kind of like, um, I had a boyfriend once who had won every possible award in the world, in the world of TV and has still continued to go on and do it. And I remember he was getting a star on Hollywood Boulevard and he said, well, it's not like I want to, I'm getting a Pulitzer prize. And I said, well, if you want a Pulitzer prize, you're you're going to need to write a book. (laughs) (laughs) So if you want to find the love of your life and you're not finding what you want, you might just need to up level, you know, your dating tools, your look, your approach, your headset, you know, and anybody that's listening to this podcast is obviously interested in, you know, getting some, you know, tips about how to do that. So I'm, I'm excited that you're passionate Mm -hmm. about creating love, everybody. Yes, yes, definitely. And so Lauren, uh, what about dating etiquette? You know, first dates, I think people are so confused, you know, what do I wear? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, do men pay, do women, you know, split the bill? It it seems like every city there's like kind of different cultural norms. And I know we spoke a little bit about that, but I'd love to hear your perspective and, um, and then second to that, the bowl analogy that we spoke about. Oh yeah. Well, I think that, um, whoever asks the person out for the date picks up the check. So if a man asks a woman out for a date, he should pick up the check. And the only time that men really want to split a check is when they don't want to see you again. Like that's pretty standard. And I think men really know this unless you're really young and everybody's broke, then that's a different story. But I think that for the most part, men, you know, a man that doesn't want to impress you, I'm speaking to women now, isn't that impressed with you. So men will try to impress you with whatever they have at the ready, be it, you know, uh, you know, if it's, if he's a broke poet, he'll write you a poem, right? If he's an amazing chef, he'll try to, he'll want to cook you an amazing meal. If he, you know, so men, men try, will try to impress you with whatever they have uh, you know, that, that, that they think you'll find impressive. And also it's like, a, this is also a little clue in profiles. Men will often lead with what they think you're going to be the most impressed with, <laughs> which is really interesting. <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of dating, in terms of picking up the check, uh, you know, I, I do kind of feel like until you're in a relationship, it's, it's, kind of good manners for the man to pick it up, to pick up the check. And once you're in a relationship, then you can start splitting things. And the, you know, that might mean that you're not going to super fancy dinners, you know, it just depends on his, um, you know, financial bandwidth. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, you can have the most epic picnic. He can take you to eat the most amazing gelato, right? There's a lot of ways for men to surprise and delight women that don't cost tons of, you know, men don't need to drop large bills to make you feel like a goddess. 
They just mm. have to be thoughtful, right? Yeah, I love that. I love yeah. that. What about men who don't pick up the tab or who are just, you know, kind of um, casual uh-huh. about it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so give me an example because she's got something on her mind, people. Can no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm just, no, I'm just curious because uh, it's just obviously hilarious. Like <laughs> it's a co- topic of discussion. You know, basically there's like two camps I've heard from friends uh, and also just my own personal experience. It feels like there's the camp of women who are like, um, you know, agree with this concept of we want we want to feel like, you know, guys kind of investing in us and taking care of us. And then the other camp is like, oh, but like I I do want to split things and I want to feel like I'm, you know, I'm like a working woman. And I, it's so funny because like there just feels like there's these two kind of philosophies around dating. Um, but I think deep down, like kind of based on my own anecdotal observations, <laughs> that I think women all really want men to pay <laughs> for the, I, at least I the think- first... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, so, so sometimes women want to split the check if they never want to see the guy again. They're like, you are a, you know, loser <laughs> and do not get the idea, wrong idea that if you, so I've had, I've had clients say, well, you know, I, I want to split the check cause I don't want him to get any ideas that I owe him anything. And I'm like, oh, you, you don't owe anybody anything. So part of that is not knowing how to set good boundaries and say no successfully. So one of the ways that women want to like to say no is, you know, sometimes I guess by splitting the check, you never need to do that. If you're on a bad date and you don't like it, just excuse yourself, go to the ladies room, come back, do not sit back down and just extend your hand for a little shake and just say, "Ah, you know, it would, thank you so much for coming out and meeting me. I do have to run, but it was a pleasure. And then literally (laughs) leave. (laughs) <laughs> and if you were out on a date with somebody and he's a creep, then go to the ladies room and then go to the, you know, you're not going to meet men in places, you know, like his apartment or, you know, a park, ben- you know, go and meet men at a, you know, little tea house or, you know, wherever, you know, the social setting. And if you don't like them, literally go to the maitre d at the front and just say, you know, um, I am so sorry that man is making me uncomfortable and I need to leave. And would you please make sure he doesn't follow me? Mm. And can you just let him know that I've left? I'm not comfortable. Wow. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Wow. And so, uh, Lauren, can you also talk to us about this bowl analogy (laughs) with oatmeal? I just loved it when you brought it up to me. It was was amazing. All right. So this is, uh, (laughs) this is about compatibility coordinates. So this So the thing about relationships is that you want to find somebody that is a good match. And there's a lot, like we were talking about, you know, are they geographically desirable? Do you have common values? Do you have common goals? But there's also something, and I've got to say, I didn't come up with the beginning of this analogy, but, and I've got to remember, I think it might've been, I don't think it was the Sterling Institute, but this I ex- I've expounded upon this. So it's called the oatmeal and the bowl. And it's like all men, if you just kind of look at this analogy, really are the oatmeal, uh, sorry, really are a bowl, the bowl. And women are like oatmeal. And what we are really looking for, what I'm looking for with my clients is to see if the man's bowl, which is really his capacity to hold the emotional life of the relationship. You know, if, if, can the guy create structure around and containment around his partner? Um, you know, part of the reason why women fall in love is because they feel safe, right? If they're healthy, you want a man who makes you feel safe. And so what we want is we want a man that doesn't feel like we're too much for us. We don't want a man that says you're too emotional or you're crazy We want a man who, when you have a feeling, is just like, oh, come here, babe. Let me give you a hug, right? You don't want a man that you destabilize just because you're having a feeling or a thought in your head. And so to that end, there are, you know, there are many different sized bowls, right? Some men have 
very small bowls. They can handle very little emotion. And if you look at the emotion, that's like the emotional life of a woman. So some women are kind of cold and a little hard. They don't produce a lot of oatmeal. Some women are oatmeal factories, right? It's just like (laughs) gallons of feelings. They're just so emotional. Some women are just nuts. They're just full of nuts. (laughs) And, you know, and some women just are fragrant and, you know, they've got berries in them and it's just, just right. So, you know, it's like Goldilocks, right? Sometimes, you know, the guy's got an enormous capacity for a lot of feeling from a woman, but the woman doesn't have enough oatmeal. And so the guy feels like he's not useful, like he's kind of empty. Some men have, some men literally have, uh, you know, a pl- you know, an, a cup that's like the size of a teacup or a thimble. So no matter what you feel, he's always getting swamped and overwhelmed. Some men are not bowls, they're plates. So it's like, you just run right off the edges. And some men want women to be the bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really, really a difficult situation because then, and that's called romantic narcissism. A lot of, you know, there are men who expect you to create the emotional containment for the relationship, but then they want to be respected as a man, the man in the relationship. And this is a big drag. All right, but I digress. Then there's another form of this where the man sometimes can be an amazing bull, Right. And you guys seem like a perfect fit. And then he loses his job or someone dies in his family, or there's a major, there's some major upset, you know, or like he goes through a divorce. And if you try to partner him, it's like, literally you get flipped out against the wall, right? He just Mm -hmm. all of a sudden becomes temporarily incapable of having a relationship. So sometimes men who are normally, um, really great partners, and you've got the right amount of oatmeal. He's got the perfect size bowl. All of a sudden, maybe he go, gets a terrible health uh, scare, or maybe something really traumatic happens in his life, or he all of a sudden loses his fortune or uh, loses a job. Something happens which shocks him. And so that man all of a sudden can temporarily flip out and that bull flips and the woman just flink gets flung across the room and splats on the wall. And so that is also a thing that can happen. And so it's really important when you start dating somebody, or if you're in a relationship with somebody that you really look at the capacity of the man to be comfortable with your feelings and the kind of relationship that you want to create and not feel overwhelmed by it. That's part of creating, you know, that's, you know, way that's like part of my compatibility checklist. That's so fascinating, Lauren. I just love that so much. I mean, it's such a great analogy that it, it makes sense, right? Like, uh, you know, cause I think also with well, female hormone, you know, the way that we have to kind of move through the world with the kind of seasonality within our bodies, right? We don't really have a lot of linearity, you know, within our emotional system. And so, you know, especially since we have periods and cycle, um, we have cycles. Right. Yeah, we have cycles. And so I love that, um, you know, in heterosexual relationships, of course, that the man is the one holding, holding the woman and holding the emotional piece. And, and I, I you spoke about, um, you know, the narcissistic kind of uh, romantic man who, um, can you say that again? Because I want to really get that. So they are the oh. ones who are who are who want the woman to create the structure and also hold the emotional container, uh, the emotional yeah, piece. Yeah, it's called being a romantic narcissist, and so it's kind of like they want you to create the structure and to contain their feelings, but they don't have any room for your feelings, and they also insist that you respect them as the man. So that could mean they are having a lot of feelings and, you know, they're with a woman who's paying all the bills. So the woman's in the woman's in the classic masculine role, but the man still wants to be respected like the man. And that's Mm. a very hard dynamic. Mm. That's a really hard dynamic. And, you know, unless those men are amazing, um, in the sack. <laughs> it's really hard. To, it's really hard to take it seriously. And even if they are, it, you know, that gets tired. Yeah. That I can imagine. Tired. 
What do you yeah. mean by what do you mean by creating structure? Can you say more about that? Yeah. So in the you know it's like uh, you know with my wrote my book uh, dating mating and manhandling many years ago. And I compared men to birds and <laughs> because, you know, they get startled when you make fast moves and they flee if you run after them. And my dog Veronica is trying to get a treat. So that was that little jingle that you were just hearing. Um, and they, they, uh, but the birds, you know, really build a nest around their wren. They will build, they build nests together. But, you know, you want a man who really builds the relationship. Most women want a man who pursues that, right? You want a man who calls you, who, you know, asks you out, who once you're on the date says, gosh, this was great. When can I see you again? who follows up with a call. Don't we like it when a guy calls you on the way home from the date? We (laughs) want men who kind of validate, you know, they pursue. (laughs) Yeah. They pursue. Men that are interested pursue. And, you know, that's why that book, He's Just Not That Into You, was such a genius break. Because it's true. Men that aren't pursuing you just are not that interested in you. So, you know, the structure that, um, that a man creates... The, and this goes to a coaching that my dear friend, Carol Allen, who you've all, you've also interviewed on the show, which is how we met. Um, she, uh, she always says that you have to, and this just seems so unfair and so sexist, but truthfully relationships with men are really on their terms. You can't change a man's terms. So if a man does not want to get married you got to accept the fact the guy does not want to get married. And if you want to get married, don't date the man. And you can, you can say to a man, if you're, you know, if a guy says, you know, I just never want to get married, you can say to him, oh, well, I'm so, I so respect that. And, um, yeah, I just don't think this is going to be a great fit. It's something I'm really, I'm really committed to creating. And then he might go, well, I didn't mean I never, never wanted to get married. If it was a right, it was, if it was the right one, but just the fact that he said he never wanted to get married, that's like a big piece of information, right? Mm. So when men say things often, all right, this is like a really important tip. We're, we're hopping around. I have something that I teach women called the secret male lemon law disclaimer. <laughs> And on a first date, men, while they're peacocking, when they're bragging, when they're saying, oh, I've won, you know, I speak like nine languages and I've won multiple awards and I just, you know, uh, bought, uh, you know, my own plane and whatever it is that they're, you know, I just won the, you know, I just won a lot of whatever it is that they think you're going to be impressed by. They'll peacock. And show off. They're basically just saying, I've got the best sperm on the bo- on the block. Pick me, please. But while they're doing this kind of peacocking dance, what they'll do is they'll let slip what they think you're going to reject them for. Mm. They're going to say something like, all my relationships end up the same way in court. Or, <laughs> you know, all my girlfriends are psycho. Or my kids, they hate me. Or, you know, my ex-wife, why doesn't she love me? Or I only date 18 year olds. They're going to say something crazy. And what you want to hear, or you, they, they might say, I have a temper problem, you know, gosh, you know, I used to have a temper pro- problem, but now it's better. Right. Or my mother hates all of my girlfriends. That would be something to listen for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that most women don't listen for what I call the lemon drop. They don't listen for that crazy thing, that little thing that a guy's going to say because they're so entranced with that beautiful picture that he's creating, right? That all of the other great stuff. And when women hear this crazy little lemon drop, what they do is they pretend they didn't hear it (laughs) because no woman would ever be as out there uh, you know, with their problems, like women wear Spanx, they wear makeup, you know, we get waxed and teased and go to the hair salon and, 
you know, we let guys know what's wrong with us later. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Not right up front, but guys let you know right up front because they know why the last three women rejected them. And if you don't, if you don't give them a hard time, then you have silently agreed to their terms. So when you hear weird information, it's always good to lean in and go, oh my God, uh, you know, what kind of anger problem, you know, have you, have you wound up in jail? Like, do you get into fights with cab drivers? Like, what does it look like? <laughs> right. So you want to like lean in and ask those, ask those questions. So funny. Oh my gosh. I'm just like laughing because, um, yeah, the lemon drop is uh, totally real and definitely I'm sure all of us can like identify with that, with the lemon drop moment and, and whether we decided to, to, you know, ask more questions or keep silent. And I love that. So can you tell us, I want to learn a little bit more about the ornithological guide to men. Like what is, what is that? Can we switch gears and talk a little bit about yeah, this yeah, book? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so basically what happened was I was, uh, you know, a very effective dater and, um, an event planner and a publicist in, you know, Hollywood. And I invited all my girlfriends to parties and blah, blah, blah. And I just seemed to be dating, you know, and in relationships with great guys. And my girlfriends were like, what are we doing wrong? Like, what would you please show us? So we created what I called the man trap pack. <laughs> and we, <laughs> it was a group of four women and we used to go out every Thursday and every Sunday, you know, Thursday night and then Sunday during the day to man friendly locations. And I would teach them how to flirt. Wow. And a lot of, you know, there was a leader, which was me, a lookout. And that would be the person that would know what every woman in our little group was looking for the types, right? You all have those women who just kind of see everything in a room. And then there was a scout and that's a person who would do a lap. If we were in a nightclub, they would just like walk around and just see if there was anybody fun there. And then, or if anybody's ex was there. And then there was a sniper and that was a person who would shoot down what we called <laughs> lame ducks <laughs> or men <laughs> that we just did not want to date, you know, that we're just, you know, that drunk guy that's just in your face and won't leave you alone. So that's how it started. And then what happened was they started calling me at all hours of night or night and day. And I finally, my boyfriend was like, you got just, they got to stop calling. You got to turn your phone off. And so I wrote I wrote this information down in a little field guide and I printed it out and I gave it to them and um, just so they'd have it in their purse, you know, in their handbags. And then, you know, what happened was I wound up selling, putting it together and selling it as a book. <laughs> wow. I love that so much. Oh my gosh. That's how it happened. It happened because women needed this information <laughs> and I just needed a personal life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that story. Amazing. And it's still available. Obviously, we can find it on Amazon. Yes. And on my website, laurenfrancis.com. Yeah. Amazing. So if someone was uh, kind of newly single, you know, what what would you tell them as like the best piece of advice? Because, I, you know, I think a lot of people who are single, even if they're newly single or like perpetually single, um, I think a lot of times people, or at least the social constructs says a lot about why we should be in partnership or relationship. And, you know, hmm. what do you think about that? Well, we, about which part? The... About the idea that we like, do we need to all be in a relationship or does that even feel like, you know, kind of an outdated concept? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, there, the statistics are that like, I don't, 50% of Manhattan is single, you know, it's like there, there are, um, you know, the need to get married in America. And I know that you have a global audience, but the need to get married in a lot of, um, you know, in Europe and Australia and America is not necessary anymore for job advancement, for social acceptance, you know? So this is a really, we're in a different age. And I do think that, you know, um, there is a thought that it's better to be in no relationship than in a bad relationship, Right. So I am a proponent for people really 
being emotionally healthy and being, you know, self-loving, self-esteeming and having self-esteeming relationships. And so if you're a person that winds up in relationships where you lose yourself or you feel like you need to become a different person to be inside of a relationship with someone, then I think it's good to take a break and to do that inner work so that you can bring your, you know, so that you can be more authentic and more empowered inside of relationships. So that that's what I think. And, and I do think that, but, you know, truthfully, you know, finding someone you can deeply love and that can deeply love you is I think the greatest gift mm. of all, right? It's the pearl of great price and it's the thing money really cannot buy. Mm. Yeah. Um, and money can help. Like, you know, having financial <laughs> problems in a relationship is very difficult. You know, it definitely right. has a deleterious negative impact, but, you know, love is the greatest gift of all. So, you know, I just think it's really worth trying. And if you're single, if you're a single woman, buy my book. Like that will give you such a good baseline about how to be a newly single or, you know, it's really great at helping with early phase dating. And then, um, you know, there's some fun conversation about being intimate and how to set boundaries, uh, and how to set boundaries with negative behaviors with suitors. And I think that all of that, you know, the more when women do not know how to say no, this is also true about men, people that can, that have a hard time saying no, have a very hard time time saying yes. If you don't feel like you can say no and set boundaries, then your defenses have to be like a barbed wire fence. Mm. But if you really know how to shut down bad behavior comfortably, then you can be much more relaxed and open to people. Mm. So, yeah. A lot of my work is really about languaging, you know, languaging things that are hard to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I got that. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. Um, can you tell us like what brought you to this world? I mean, you mentioned obviously your friends asking you for all this advice, um, but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Like what, what's been your journey, Lauren? Like, can you tell us a little bit more about what mm. brought you to, to this, to this world? Mm. Well, you know, I was, um, always boy crazy. You know, I definitely <laughs> loved love and romance novels and, you know, I remember when I was little, Sleeping Beauty had three fairy godmothers, you know, and I used to see them literally over my bed when I was little, bibbledy bobbledy boo. And uh, that was like a Disney thing. And yeah, so I've always loved, right? You know, I read the works of Shakespeare when I was 14. I loved, I loved, you know, As You Like It, uh, which is a play. Shakespeare. So I've always been, uh, you know, those kind of charming arts and the, um, you know, Jane Austen. And I've always been entranced by the magic of love and, you know, creating love is like learning its own language, right? It's kind of like, uh, speaking French, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I just think it's been part of my mission. And interestingly, Mm. I will say, I don't know if your viewership believes in astrology or not. Is that like a, not a thing? No, people, people are, have mixed, you know, mixed understandings. Things, but yeah, in my, um, astrology, it's really, it's like in my chart that I've got this exalted <laughs> Venus in Pisces apparently, which is like this kind of like super femme kind of female sensibility. So I just love love and I love, you know, I love people falling in love and, mm. uh, you know, I love heart centered, heart led relationships and, you know, and then I've also had this love of fashion and beauty and I love helping women blossom and turn into the most kind of radiant, versions of themselves that they can be. And I became a transformational teacher and a transformational coach. Um, you know, and I had my own journey with 
love and, you know, learning. And now it's like been one of the greatest joys of my life to work with like literally, I mean, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people Mm. um, have downloaded my, listened to me or read some, you know, so it's, it's been very meaningful. Mm. I think, I think love is the most, is a, is a noble goal and calling. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. It's so crazy how time has just flown on this conversation. Uh, Lauren, what sort of things have surprised you the most on this journey looking back? Oh, I think that I just kind of made it up. You know, I just think there was no real roadmap for what I was doing. It was very intuitive. It was kind of like, it was, you know, Oprah said this great thing. She said, you know, um, if you do what you lo- if if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm. And I think mm. Mm, it's really interesting that um, you know one things flowed into you know it's like I now have like a brand called Love Script, which are bath and body products. You know, it's just like each thing has fl- you know each thing. It's it's been a creative. I've lived a creative life, and I've gotten the opportunity to you know write books and present and be on TV and work one-on-one with people. So it's just, I think the thing that's surprised me or delighted me the most, the thing that really delights me the most is when, uh, you know, I work with people and they fall in love and it works (laughs) when I see their lives change and they get married and they have babies and they're, you know, have a very high success rate of the people that like do the work that we do together they do find their people and they stay together. It's not like, you know, it's not like connecting. I really believe in falling in love from the inside out as well as the outside in. What does that mean? I really believe, I believe that, um, you know, I want people to be, I want people to live their desires. Right. But I feel like when you fall in love on the inner planes, when, once you understand what you need on the inner planes, everybody knows what they're attracted to on the outside, but to really know what you need on the inside, that's, that's a lot of the work that I do is getting really clear about what the real emotional fit is or what the heart healing dynamic is that you need to not get rewounded by love. That's the, Mm. that's the biggest thing people need to learn. And I have digital programs for that. I have, pro- I have like amazing programs that really do help people understand what they're, what they're looking for, what they need to be sourcing. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. I love, I mean, what are some of maybe like one question folks who are, you know, dating could ask themselves, but, you know, before going on a date in terms of like, what is it that they need to be looking for in terms of their own values? Um, well, I think that you need to be clear about what your relationship goals are and see if this person is at that life stage. So if you want to get married, dating somebody who's separated is not a good man plan, (laughs) right? You want to be dating people that really are available for the thing that you want to create. So that's the, that's, that's really, that will save you so much time. That will save you so much time. I have a client who dated somebody and he had been newly divorced. He was grumpy. He was not ready for relationship. They went out. It was kind of like, oh, it was bust. And he kind of kept in touch with her via text. And she was like, she kind of shined him on a little bit. And then finally, like one day she said, you know, honestly, it just didn't seem like you were that interested. And he was like, no, no, I really am interested. I just was not ready and they are now seriously dating, hmm. you know, and he called her and he said, I, I'm, my heart is ready for love. I'm ready for love again. <laughs> I just wasn't ready. So it's okay. It's okay to say no to what you don't want. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Lauren, this has been so much fun. What do you want to tell our (laughs) listeners (laughs) about that? You you were fabulous and you deserve (laughs) to be loved and don't waste your time with people that can't love you. Mm. Just don't bother. Just, you know, there's too many fish in the sea and just, you know, 
if you will, the other thing is nobody knows you're single. So if you're wandering around the world, nobody really knows you're single. You have to signal your attraction. So in my book, I have a lot of flirt tips that are really, you can, that are very ladylike that don't put you, don't, don't, you don't stick your neck out too far. They're very comfortable. Just learning how to have social, comfortable social discourse and intercourse is very important to learn how to do. And that, you know, honestly, no one's too old. You know, I have clients in their nineties. I'm not kidding. (laughs) Women are constantly saying, I'm too old. Am I too old? This is actually the funniest story. I'll wrap up with this. This is hilarious. So I once had a gal call me up. She said, my mother says I'm too old. My mother says I'm too old. I said, how old are you? She's like 38. I was like, yeah, you're definitely not too old. She said, oh, I've been dating online. It's not working. I was like, okay, let me see your photos. So she sends me a picture and she's a school principal. And I looked at her profile picture and literally it was a picture of a desk with a globe. (laughs) And I said, babe, I was like, do you really, do you know that you're not in the photo? She was like, what? So she hadn't looked at her profile picture online and uh, she was to the side. So that was the first thing. Like if you think online dating doesn't work, like sometimes it's just really, you can't even imagine how bad your photos are. (laughs) And, um, anyway, so we redid her photos and we wrote a profile and she is now brilliantly married and so, so, so happy. And she was at an age where she like, um, didn't take my advice and dated some of the wrong people. (laughs) <laughs> but then she finally got serious and came back and she was like, okay. And we had been putting that she definitely wanted children. I said, you know what? A lot of men really definitely want to fall in love, but they don't definitely know if they want children. So let's put that into a maybe or like a not sure category, right? Because you got to remember online dating, your marketing to the end user. It's not for you. You're like, it's like an ad that you're putting out. It's like a casting call. Right. So, and because of her age, I think she was like, I think she was 40 at this point. Um, men that definitely want to get married and have children are looking for much younger women, right? They're not going to be naturally going to women that are nearing kind of like the end of the natural fertility clock. So it's like, you know, you want to have children, I'm committed to you having them, but let's just see if we can find someone who writes not sure, but wants to get married. And she did that and she immediately found this amazing guy. But then she looked at his photo and she was like, there's a girl in his photo. It was like, yeah, the girl in that photo is his best friend because he is so uncomfortable that he literally needed moral support. I could just tell from looking at the photo. Yeah. <laughs> and then she was like, well, he's kind of overweight. He's like 20 pounds overweight. I was like, honey, he's been sitting on a couch eating Cheetos because he is so bored because he doesn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> like, you are going to start dating him. He will lose that in a month. Cut to, he lost that in a month. They went hiking. And she was like, I don't like the way he dresses. And I was like, you can tell him, honey, would you like to go shopping? The answer was yes. <laughs> so like this this petty stuff, like weight can be lost, shirts can be changed. What you can't change is somebody's character and what their relationship goals are. And they are married and they are as happy as clams. And I'm going to find out if she's pregnant because I just remembered her and, um, you know, life is amazing. So there we go. Amazing. Amazing. I love that story so much. (laughs) Thank you. Um, yeah. And there's so many women who are freezing their eggs now. So it's like really unlocking a lot more, you know, later, later births and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so Lauren, where can people find you? Are there any resources <laughs> that you can uh, point folks to in order to? I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna no, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, you can find me at my website, which is laurenfrancis.com, which is L A U R E N F R A N C E S dot com. Mm. Laurenfrancis.com. Easy peasy, and um. I am Lauren's Love RX on uh, YouTube and blog, you know, 
that's our new podcast. And um, yeah, but Lauren, Lauren, laurenfrancis.com. There you go. And my brand Love Script is another place to find me, which is L O V E S C R I P T. Oh yes, Love Script. And I, I definitely encourage the audience to check out Love Script. And it's just amazing products. I go get compliments all the time. <laughs> well, and I created this perfume called Love Script. So this is like a really funny story. I created this perfume called Love Script. Uh, you know, and so many women have fallen. It it literally does the flirting for you. So you can check it out and give me a romantic report. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Oh my gosh, Lauren, thank you so much for your time. I'm so grateful that we had this conversation. I think it's going to help too. a lot of people. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for having me. And I'm sending all of you so much love. You deserve it. Oh, well, thank you. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learn about the art of being an irresistible love magnet with Lauren Francis. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one on one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well being, and spirituality. Thanks again.